Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Ed Getz, and I want to welcome you to the 2021 Richard A. Brustad Memorial Lecture. Today, we are featuring Professor Alora Lee Raymond of Georgia Tech University. We're very glad to have her here today, here figuratively, of course. Our guest will speak for 40 and 45 minutes uh, and then take questions afterwards. If you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A function that you can see on the bottom of your screen if you uh, scroll over your screen. Uh, I will moderate the Q&A session by first going through all of the questions that I see in the Q&A uh, environment. If they are exhausted before we are out of time, we can go to the raise your hand method, though uh, that's kind of difficult uh, with a group this size. So um, I encourage you to, uh, to put your questions in the Q&A environment. And finally, I think the last thing I want to note uh, is that this is being recorded and will be available at some point um, uh, shortly after uh, today's event on the, uh, on the Humphrey uh, website. So the Brustad Lecture was established by the friends, colleagues, and family of Mr. Richard A. Brustad in 2017, shortly after his passing. These colleagues also established a fellowship in his name that supports Humphrey School students who are interested in affordable housing. Richard Brustad was an urban planner and a real estate developer who led the creation of affordable housing in cities, suburbs, and outstate regions of Minnesota during a 53-year career. During his career, Brustad worked with the U.S. Housing and Home Finance Agency he was the housing director of the Metropolitan Council of the Twin Cities. He was the executive director of the Minneapolis Public Housing and Redevelopment Authority and co-founder of Brighton Development Corporation and the president of the Community Housing Development Corporation. His was a career dedicated to the development and preservation of affordable housing. And this lecture series continues his legacy by serving as a forum for discussing the important housing issues facing both the Twin Cities region and the country as well. And so we welcome you to it. To introduce our speaker, I would like to turn to David Weggio. Dave is the acting director of the Federal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And he's been there, or he's been in that position since the Biden administration took over in January. In that capacity, he oversees a $600 million budget David has been at the CFPB since 2012 and was most recently the Chief Strategy Officer for the Bureau. But perhaps most importantly, Dave is a graduate of the Humphrey School, and uh, that's where he received his Master's of Public Policy and no doubt where he learned most of what he needs to know to run a federal bureau. Dave, I will hand it to you now. Great. Thank you, Ed, and absolutely validating everything you just said. Uh, so, uh, listen, thanks. It's, it's great to be sort of virtually back in my home away from home to participate in this Brustad lecture with Dr. Raymond. Uh, her analysis on the growing eviction-driven housing crisis really gets right at the heart of what the CFPB has been focusing on. In fact, I uh, emailed Ed about that and sort of asked uh, if, if I might be able to, to play a role here, but, you know, sort of largely based on how aligned I felt with what I am sure we were about to hear uh, is. And so, I want to briefly share a few thoughts on the current state of affairs uh, from this perch over at the CFPB, and then, of course, introduce Dr. Raymond from the lecture. You know, the harms caused by the COVID-19 pandemic continue to put millions of people at risk. And one of the greatest potential tragedies unfolding from our perspective is an unprecedented increase in housing insecurity, which we know not only threatens families financially, but which the CDC has found can contribute to further spread of the virus. The CDC has extended its moratorium on residential evictions through June 30th to keep people in their homes and out of shelters or other shared living settings and to stop the spread of COVID-19. However, evictions have continued to this day. Some tenants may be unaware of their protections under the CDC order or may not understand the steps they have to take to receive the order's protections. Others may have been improperly discouraged from submitting the required information to their landlords to stop certain evictions through June 30th. Tens of thousands of tenants and families are being evicted every week, often without being told of their rights under the moratorium. For each individual or family seeing their belongings left on the curb, an eviction is a tragedy. It's a turning point and a challenge from which it is extremely hard to recover. We must work hard every day to help renters avoid this, 
About 9 million tenant households are behind on their rental payments, while about 900,000 tenant households are evicted in a typical year. In other words, we are currently facing an eviction crisis roughly tenfold the scale of the pre-pandemic normal. The federal government has stepped in with strong measures to help families during the crisis. Last week, the CFPB announced an interim final rule with a straightforward purpose. Our rule requires debt collectors to provide tenants who may have rights under the order with written notice of those rights so that eligible people will have a chance to save their homes. We've also clarified that debt collectors can be held accountable under federal law if they violate this requirement. This new action will help ensure vulnerable consumers can take advantage of their protections under the law. Protecting renters is also an issue with important implications for racial equity. Like so much else about COVID-19, the economic damage has disproportionately affected communities of color. Job losses have been concentrated in low-wage sectors, even while essential workers were required to put themselves at risk. Black and Hispanic households are roughly twice as likely to be behind on their rent compared to white households. Black and Hispanic households are more than twice as likely to rent compared with white households. And it's a disparity that denies them a key avenue of wealth accumulation. We don't have to look back very far to see how a housing crisis can cause widespread damage to the entire economy and how economic turmoil can deepen inequalities. Communities of color still have not fully recovered from the damage of the Great Recession. Some of that damage is reflected in the home ownership numbers I just cited. Millions of people across the country are struggling right now, and the coronavirus is still killing hundreds of people every day. We will continue doing everything we can to help the most vulnerable among us during this crisis. So thank you for the opportunity to put that frame on. I'm very excited to hear uh, Dr. Raymond's presentation and it's an honor to introduce her. So without further ado, Laura Lee Raymond is an urban planner and assistant professor in the School of City and Regional Planning in the College of Design at Georgia Tech. She's interested in the financialization of housing and property and land, displacement and dispossession through housing systems, housing and disasters, housing justice, race, segregation, and the transnational Pacific Islander community, uh, all of which are things, <laughs> are things I care deeply about. Dr. Raymond has explored widening housing wealth inequality following the real estate and financial crises of the 2000s and the relationship between financialization of rental housing and eviction-led displacement. She studied the effect of the foreclosure and affordability crisis on Pacific Islander communities in Los Angeles, as well as the financialization of customary land in Samoa. Dr. Raymond has ongoing projects on housing, displacement and disasters, including work on eviction and migra migration following disasters. She is widely published, and I am excited to hear what she has to present to us today. So without further ado, Dr. Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear about the work that you're doing the CFPB. And I hope that uh, at the end of the talk, when we turn to the COVID-19 crisis, um, we can uh, have a great discussion about that. Um, Today, I want to talk about a series of research articles that I've written about investor activity uh, and rental housing crises. Um, just gonna switch quickly here. The overall uh, framework for this talk is I'm hoping to talk briefly about the rise of institutional investors in the single family rental sector. I talk about the characteristics of institutional investors uh, that you know, we found in the research since the foreclosure crisis. And then I wanna segue into two papers that really examine uh, the relationship between evictions and these large corporate institutional investors. So looking at displacement and gentrification in Atlanta from an evictions framework. And then finally, I wanna talk about implications for the COVID-19 housing crisis, which we know has been characterized uh, by widespread worries about evictions and eviction prevention. So first off, I wanna talk about, uh, define some terms. What is an institutional investor? There's nothing new about uh, investors being involved in real estate. Um, what are people talking about when they, when they talk about these new corporate landlords? Um, it, there's many different definitions that we're gonna to refer to. Uh, in some part, uh, we're talking about corporations, limited liability companies, limited liability partnerships, real estate investment trusts, um, and when I talk about uh, institutional investors, I'm typically talking about national or global investment firms um, that, that are just larger than the typical um, small uh, corporate owners that you might see operating within a given metropolitan region. Um, so these are typically firms that might own tens or thousands of units. And what's particularly new about these groups is that they um, moved into the single family rental space in a, in a new way. So, Institutional investors, uh, 
are very much associated with distressed sales that happened during the foreclosure crisis. Uh, this is coming from a report out of the Philly Fed um, where they looked at institutional purchases from 2000 to 2014 and documented a rise from around 5% to about 14% um, over this time period uh, by institutional investors. And then when they broke apart these sales by uh, regular sales or distressed sales, meaning foreclosures, they found that really there's an extremely uh, sharp rise in institutional purchases of uh, distressed properties. So when we talk about institutional investors, um, in the single family rental space, we're really thinking about investors who are purchasing distressed properties. Um, and that's the framework that we're coming from. Part of the rise in institutional investment after the foreclosure crisis was a result of policy. Um, so uh, if you can cast your mind back to the financial crisis uh, at the end of the 2000s, um, there, you know, there was a lot of a tightness of credit, there wasn't a very strong fiscal response. And at that point, um, uh, Ben Bernanke started to encourage institutional investors to use capital to convert bank owned homes or um, REOs to rentals was a phrase that we were seeing uh, very often at that time. Um, part of this response was not just encouragement, but actually um, uh, FIFA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac started to put together pilot bulk sales program to think about how might we actually um, sell some of our bank owned homes or um, GSE owned homes uh, to private investors. And I, you know, there's a couple of instances during this period where, where I think that there were, was an opportunity for um, policymakers to emphasize different uh, priorities. And one of this pilot bulk sale, I think was a very interesting moment in which, um, you know, FIFA solicited uh, suggestions from, from interested parties and stakeholders all around the nation. And you had a range of opinions. Um, one proposal that was really interesting was from enterprise community partners and they really emphasized uh, neighborhood stabilization goals and permanent affordability in terms of, you know, how should we sell um, all of these bank owned homes? If we're gonna do bulk sales, let's structure these transactions in a way that promotes neighborhood revitalization and stabilization. Uh, and also the goal of permanent affordability. And then you saw other proposals at this time that were very much um, learning the lessons from the savings and loan crisis and suggesting structured transactions that would really prioritize um, the highest sale price. Uh, so they were really focusing on something that more approached an arm's length transaction where the goal was really to just maximize the return, um, the returns that uh, the sellers got. And that, and that ultimately, that second proposal really defined how um, pilot bulk sale was uh, constructed. And over time, you started to see not just Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but also um, banks like Bank of America, who had a lot of REO um, selling to institutional investors. And, and from the 2011 to 2013 period, there were about uh, 350,000 homes nationwide that were sold to institutional inventors, investors with the goal not of turning these into rental, uh, into uh, reselling them back into the owner-occupied housing stock but uh, turning them into rentals. The other really interesting policy moment, I think, was when the first uh, single family rental securitization was created. Um, and this was also done, you know, as part of conversations primarily within private industry, but also with input um, from government. And the, the, you know, the initial construction of this securitization um, security was, um, there were different ways to structure that might prioritize, you know, rental, um, price uh, sustainability and others that really focused on the um, kind of the use of these homes as collateral. And so the kind of eventual structure of this single, the first single family rental securitization, I think set the kind of made the mold for others to follow um, and created um, just the particular type of investment vehicle that would be used uh, going forward. And at, at that point in 2017, Fannie Mae, um, you know, really decided to support this industry with $1 billion um, in terms of investments in these single family rental securitizations. And you saw the creation of a new industry. And part of this very much had to do with um, the actions that groups like Invitation Homes, Deutsche Bank, Blackstone were taking, but also you saw some coordination um, with the federal government 
And I, I wanna emphasize this because I think after every housing crisis, we have an opportunity to influence what happens through policy and we have the opportunity to learn from past crises. So I'm dwelling a little bit on this space because I think um, when we look at uh, the current housing crisis that we're in, we can think about which of these examples we wanna follow um, and which we uh, wanna leave behind. So this chart on the left shows the total number of homes that were purchased by different uh, single family rental uh, firms. And you can see, again, that these firms are really purchasing distressed sales. They're purchasing when prices are low. And um, the sales taper off after 2015 when you started to see home prices stabilize nationwide. So that, those were national numbers. And there's a lot of variation in different urban regions around the country. Um, so there's been some research done on where single family rentals are concentrated. Uh, the kind of overall conclusion is that the Sunbelt um, Sun Belt metropolitan regions are places that were particularly attractive for these institutional investors. Um, and actually this study is really looking at single family rentals overall. Um, if you see on the, the table here on the right, uh, cities listed under the high category are places where single family rentals increased a lot. Uh, cities listed under the low are places where you really didn't see much increase in single family rentals overall in the middle of that's all others. Um, and so the characteristics of places that tended to have a lot more single family rentals um, are places that responded to the 2000s price bubble with new home construction. And so these places didn't have as much of a price spike as you might have seen in some cities, um, but they had a really um, a vast expansion in the number of new, new homes constructed. And then after the financial crisis hit, uh, tended to have more, more construction foreclosures and a prolonged um, and extended period of depressed home prices. So in cities like Atlanta, you didn't really see prices started to turn around until 2013. Um, there are other cities around the country, you know, Boston, San Francisco, where prices had rebounded uh, back to peak levels long before that. Uh, in addition to there being different patterns of investment between cities, there's also um, particularly pattern, particular patterns of investment within cities. So neighborhoods uh, with growing single family rentals tend to have racial and ethnic diversity. They tend to have a high prevalence of children. Um, so these uh, investment patterns you know, affect families given the type of housing stock we're talking about. Uh, they tend to have low housing choice voucher rates and other forms of subsidy. So these are um, unsubsidized rental housings by and large, rental housing by and large. And they also tend to be located in places with rising economic disadvantage. Uh, and in part, this has to do with the footprint of the available distressed properties. Um, so the footprint of subprime lending, the footprint of the uh, foreclosure crisis, and in part, this has to do with the purchase patterns of institutional investors in single family rentals. So this is another um, view of within cities where, invest where investors renting homes. Uh, previously, I showed you charts of where investors were purchasing homes. Um, but, you know, where, what does that all add up to? This is just a map of the uh, metropolitan Atlanta area. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize here is that this little black outline in the middle, that's the city of Atlanta um, with one of the urban cores. We're a polycentric um, city. But the footprint of single family rentals is really in the suburbs and even in some ex exurban areas. Um, so in this study, they've looked at uh, urban regions around the country and majority of the homes are outside of principal city limits. There are a couple cities like Phoenix where you do see a significant proportion in this, in the, um, within the city. Um, and the other point that I'd make is that while when you look at institutional investors, they have a really low market share nationally. They're price takers, they're not price makers at a national level. When you start to look within particular urban regions um, or within particular submarkets in urban regions, uh, they might have a pretty high market share. So you can see in certain areas of the metropolitan Atlanta area, there's a high concentration of um, not just individual firms, but overall um, high concentration of institutional investors in these markets. So here's another view I wanted to show of, um, you know, purchase patterns. Uh, so this chart is again taken from a report by the Philly Fed. It shows the change of percent in home purchases by institutional investors. In the Atlanta region, you can see very much this dark blue area represents um, uh, places where you know the increase in the percentage of purchases by institutional investors was higher than 15%. So it was higher than 15% uh, increase in purchases. And this is 
really following in the footprint of uh, subprime lending and also the foreclosure crisis. Uh, you can see there's also other areas that weren't as heavily characterized by subprime lending that also had very high um, interest from institutional investors. Um, so thinking about the geography of where institutional investors are purchasing, um, Another question that we might ask is, how do institutional investors earn profits in single family rentals? And what does that have to do? What, what are the consequences for households? And what are the consequences for neighborhoods? Uh, so this, these five words here, four of them come from a typology uh, developed by Alan Malik, where he talks about um, the investment strategies of investors in distressed properties. Um, and the, the first two, rehab and flip, are really short-term uh, strategies that investors use when they're dealing with a foreclosed home, a bank-owned home. Um, and typically, the investor here is only trying to own this home for a year or less, and they might re rehab the home and sell it to an owner-occupier or um, to you know a, as a rental property. Or they might just flip the home where they really don't do very much rehab and just buy it and then try and sell it for slightly more. Um, and these. Um, both of these investment strategies have um, ramifications both for uh, whoever lives in that home and also for uh, the neighborhoods that these practices happen in. Um, the other two strategies that I think are more characteristic of uh, institutional investors are the milk and hold strategy. So milkers, according to the Malik typology, is a strategy where you're really trying to maximize rental revenue by minimizing your maintenance um, and by maximizing the amount of rent you charge. And often the, the negative consequences for neighborhoods, um, for tenants, you have this kind of declining household quality, um, lots of maintenance issues. And for neighborhoods, you have um, properties which might not be well maintained over time um, and create all of the problems associated with deteriorating properties. And then uh, sometimes the strategy here at the end is just to abandon the property and then you know the local jurisdiction is left to um, deal with this property. The hold strategy is one in which the, the you know the method of uh, of making a profit is really based on capital gains. So buying low, selling high. It's really all about price appreciation. And in this uh, instance, the strategy that the institutional investor um, might take is really just about that price appreciation. And sometimes even the investor might hold the property vacant because there's so little um, interest in the rental, um, in, the rent, in, in the gains from rents, and there's just much more of an interest in um, the long-term price appreciation that might be seen. And then I, I added a category here. Um, and I'm gonna switch and just show you, you know, these two strategies we're seeing less of from the institutional investors and these three we're seeing more of. I added a category here called collateralize, and that is something that's come out of Aaron Glantz's work on uh, institutional investors in single family rentals, where he points out that one of the main benefits um, against these homes. So if you own a lot of single family rentals across the country, um, there's a benefit there in just being able to use these to obtain um, uh, you know, favorable interest rates. So, Given this different typology of how institutional investors earn profits in single family rentals, um, what does the research say? Uh, there's been one study that I'm aware of that suggests that nominal returns are around 8.5%. And overall, um, these returns are split pretty evenly between capital gains, and that would be kind of the hold uh, strategy, or higher net rental yields, and that would be um, either the milk strategy or something, something like that. Um, but the authors found that different strategies were more uh, prevalent in different types of cities and also within cities, uh, certain types of neighborhoods had uh, different strategies at play. So higher price tier cities accrued more capital gains, lower price tier cities had higher net rental yields. And they found that within cities, regardless of what tier you were in, if you were in a lower price tier neighborhood, um, these places had higher total returns because of both higher yields and higher home price appreciation. And I think that in part has to do with the timing of this study where, um, and the timing of when institutional investors entered um, the market where they were really buying low in, you know, between 2011 and 2014 or 2015, um, and then being evaluated a couple of years later. And during that whole time, you, you saw home prices appreciate in most places across the country. 
The other thing I'd add is that there's been research in part just based on earnings calls and um, actually, you know, the reporting uh, to investors and shareholders um, by these firms themselves is that there's a, a not insignificant amount of the revenue is coming from fees, um, from late fees, eviction fees, security deposits, um, and these aren't the bulk of their profits at all, but they're considerable and it's, um, you know, part of their strategy for uh, being profitable in the space is, you know, maximizing fee revenue. Um, so given that background, I want to talk really briefly, or not really briefly, but I want to talk about two studies that I've done. I'm not going to dive into regression results or anything like that. We'll keep it pretty high level, uh, but these are both uh, from research studies and I'll, I'll list them at the end of the talks so that if you are interested, you can um, download a copy or email me and I'll, I'll uh, send you a copy. So the first um, the first paper that I want to talk about is from Foreclosure to Eviction, Housing Insecurity in Corporate-Owned Single-Family Rentals. Um, and this study is really about trying to evaluate institutional investors by looking at their eviction filing rates relative to other types of landlords. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about eviction specifically and why they're so um, why they're so damaging to households and to neighborhoods. And I want to thank David very much for uh, describing some of the reasons why they're really problematic. Um, I think, you know, to some extent, evictions um, under some circumstances make sense. There are times when a landlord um, or, you know, somebody else living in the household might need to go through with an eviction. Uh, but what research is finding is that this is an incredibly widespread practice. Uh, when we look at the Atlanta region, we're finding really high rates of eviction. Uh, I think in our in this 2015 study, we found an average eviction filing rate of about 20, 22%, um, where on average 22% of all households were facing an eviction filing and something like 6% uh, were actually receiving an eviction judgment. Um, and that's that those figures have held up in other uh, data sources that have uh, emerged since we published this paper. Um, so this is um, a pre, you know a feature of uh, rental housing markets in many cities around the country, including Atlanta. Um, and, and evictions and, and rental housing insecurity are associated with uh, lots of bad consequences, not just for uh, the renter who's facing eviction. You know, it's associated with homelessness spells. It's associated with um, with worsening stress-related illnesses. Um, it's associated with job loss and not long-term job loss, but short-term job loss, and also with a, a permanent decline in wealth. Um, but there's also a lot of negative consequences for neighborhoods. Uh, one of them is uh, poor school outcomes. So in some areas of Atlanta where we have very high eviction rates, um, where you know close to 40% of all rental households are facing eviction in a given year, and something like 15% are actually going through a forced move, you see really high turnover in classrooms. It's just incredibly hard um, for, you know, for part of the uh, drive to understand evictions in Atlanta has come from our schools um, and from uh, philanthropic groups who are interested in school quality. Classroom when 15%, you know, our high, high numbers of children are, are coming and going throughout the year. Um, so other, other consequences, negative consequences of eviction that have been found are um, that often one forced move is, you know, increases a lot of stress and is really difficult for people. Um, but because of the very short time frames around eviction, you'll find that people will move somewhere that's very suboptimal, and then they'll have this longer period of two years where they're just trying to get back to um, the level of the, the quality of housing that they had previous to the eviction. So they'll they'll move somewhere uh, with this very shortened search, um, and then it. it will be in a, you know, not a great situation and they'll move again and possibly again. Um, so it can lead to this very long period of housing instability. And then the final thing I'd mention is that just having an eviction filing in your record can be really problematic. Um, so here I wanna talk you guys very briefly, um, I'm not gonna explain every aspect of this chart, um, but I wanna talk to you kind of about the eviction process and different types of eviction activity that happen through, um, through the legal system. So this, this flow chart uh, shows formal evictions um, as they move through the courts. And this is based on uh, Fulton County. So this process is pretty similar across the country, but there are some differences 
you know, particularly the, the dispossessory courts are particular to the Fulton County courts. Um, and the main distinction that I want to make here is between eviction filings, serial filings, and eviction judgments. Um, so I want to draw your attention to this top box right here, which is where um, the beginning of an eviction process might happen. Um, and this is when a landlord files, initially files for an eviction. Um, and one of the really negative consequences for tenants can happen right at this step, regardless of whether this process goes any further, regardless if they get to the end and the landlord acquires the right to legally um, eject the tenant from their home and take possession of the property. Um, even if there is a, just an eviction filing in many states across the country, including Georgia, this can really damage your ability to rent again. When we talk to housing authorities um, in the Atlanta area, we, we hear them say that, you know, it's very likely that a tenant could lose their housing choice voucher just for having an eviction filing. Um, when we talk to um, rental um, firms around the city, um, we find that often they would refuse to rent a tenant who had just an eviction filing, even if it, even if it had been, didn't get any further than that. Um, so there are a lot of negative consequences associated with eviction filings. Um, and, but they don't always necessarily end in a displacement. Um, all of these different boxes represent different outcomes, legal outcomes that can happen from the beginning of an eviction court case. And the one that we examined in one of the studies um, has, is an eviction judgment. So that's when the process uh, is, comes, comes to completion and the landlord acquires this um, ability or legal right to ev evict the tenant, to remove them from the premises. Um, so with, with that framework, I want to talk about um, this particular study where we looked at what are institutional investors like as landlords of single family homes. Um, and this was written um, at a time when not a lot was known about what these landlords would be like. We knew that they were larger firms. They um, had more in terms of you know, cash on hand. Um, and there were a lot of questions. Would these firms um, create rental opportunities in places that were had not formally been available to tenants uh, because of ex exclusionary zoning? Would these, you know, would these institutional invest investors, by turning owner-occupied housing stock into rentals, would that somehow help um, give renters an opportunity to live in places where that were, you know, typically owner-occupied? Um, would institutional investors? Um, you know, be better able to maintain properties than mom and pops. We had sort of a mixture of positive and negative expectations about how this might affect rental markets. So, um, so this, this study was really about trying to understand, you know, from a housing instability perspective, are institutional investors better, no worse, um, uh, or otherwise from other types of, um, of landlords. And we segmented um, the different types of landlords um, just by looking at whether they were local, regional, or national. We also were interested in whether they were small um, or, you know, small mom and pop firms owning less than 15 units um, or, or really large firms owning, you know, thousands of units in the metro area. And finally, we're interested in, you know, what were the consequences for, you know, affordability, housing insecurity, and for neighborhood change. So I want to talk about um, that final question in the second study more than the first. Um, but those are some of the questions we're uh, trying to answer here. So the study area for this first um, paper is Fulton County, Georgia. Um, this is the main county, the most populous county in the Atlanta metropolitan area. And this black outline here represents the city of Atlanta. Uh, and you can see here that single family rentals are really concentrated in the Southwest of Fulton County. That's very much the, uh, in the footprint of the subprime uh, lending and of the foreclosure crisis. And also many of these neighborhoods are historically black neighborhoods, predominantly black neighborhoods. Uh, so it's not exactly the, the geography of rental housing in Fulton County. You tend to see a lot of rental housing kind of in this Northwest spine that follows the, um, the public transportation uh, train line, but uh, single family rentals tend to be concentrated in this Southwest Georgia, uh, Southwest of Fulton County. So when we first looked at um, post foreclosure homes, we we're just interested how many of them, you know, went back into owner occupancy and how many of them uh, ended up as rental properties. Um, and 
we just kind of looked at, you know, look, let's look at all single family homes. What's the percentage that are unoccupied? What's the percentage that are rentals? 78% um, of all single family homes in Fulton County uh, in this time frame were owner occupied, according to our analysis, 22% were rentals. However, the post foreclosure single family homes, and these are homes that had very recently been owner occupied, um, more than half of them were rentals and less than half of them were owner occupied. So, you know, a large proportion of these uh, bank owned homes became single family rentals um, after the crisis. And we found a, a big disparity in how these properties um, were owned. So when we looked overall at single family rentals, um, just 9% were owned by large landlords that own more than 15 properties in uh, Fulton County. And we looked at post foreclosure properties, 17% were owned by large landlords. Um, and we also found that eviction filing rates were much higher in the post foreclosure properties than they were overall. So 4% um, was the eviction filing rate in um, single family rentals across, you know, all different types of, of um, landlords or, you know, ownership situations. Um, but when we just looked at the post foreclosure properties, the eviction filing rate was really high around 11%, which is pretty high for single family. Um, when we broke this down by landlord type, we found, um, we looked at small landlords who own less than 15 properties, large landlords who own more than 15 properties, but we excluded institutional investors, which are these known firms like at the time, Colony Starwood, um, Havenbrook, American Residential. Um, those are some of the operators who, some of these have merged since, but who were institutional investors uh, in Atlanta. We found that small landlords had a pretty low, um, not distinguishable from average eviction rate, just about 5%. Larger landlords tended to have um, many a much higher eviction filing rate, so closer to 14%. And the institutional investors, um, it was a bit of an eye-popping number, but were filing evictions against 20% of their um, tenants in the year in which we studied. And this was really driven um, by some firms more than others. So when we looked by firm, there was a wide disparity in practices. Uh, Colony Starwood filed eviction notices against more than a third of their tenants um, in the year in which we looked, and that, you know, that was the high and the low was invitation homes, um, which filed evictions against still a very high rate, um, you know, almost 14% of their tenants. So these are all just descriptive statistics. They don't really account for tenant characteristics or anything like that. Um, but we did, you know, put these into a regression framework. Um, we controlled for property quality and neighborhood characteristics. And we even tried to impute, you know, tenant characteristics um, based on the block group that the property was located in. And we found, um, we kind of confirmed this distribution, even with controls, it didn't change a whole lot. We found the Colony Starwood was two times more likely to file an eviction than average. Um, and Invitation Homes was 11% more likely. Um, and overall, the large owners were 63% more likely to file um, for an eviction against their tenants. And you know, post foreclosure properties were 59% more likely to have eviction notices. Um, so overall, there are, our conclusion from this was that the disposition strategies for distressed properties after the foreclosure crisis um, didn't occur in a way to encourage uh, housing stability or to the extent that eviction, high eviction rates can be associated with, you know, neighborhood instability. Um, those disposition strategies um, weren't necessarily beneficial for the, for the people who would live in these properties after the foreclosure crisis or Situated. And, you know, the housing insecurity, um, you know, so the housing insecurity was these larger landlords and these institutional investors in single family rentals were contributing to housing security. And that footprint, you know, from the subprime and foreclosure crisis, the housing insecurity from that event was followed by this pattern of housing insecurity um, in the form of evictions in the 2010s. So we're seeing a continuity um, between crises. So the second study that I want to talk about looks actually at multifamily. And I'm going to go quickly because I think I'm coming up near the, um, I want to make sure that we leave adequate time for questions at the end. Um, in this paper, we're looking at gentrification and investor purchases of rental housing, um, evictions, the displacement of black residents from Atlanta. So in this study, we're looking at um, investor purchases, this time not of single family rentals, but of multifamily. 
Um, and we're trying again to evaluate um, how evictions, um, we're trying to evaluate the consequences for tenants and for neighborhoods in part by looking at eviction rates after these investor purchases happen. Um, so on the right, you see again, Fulton County and the city of Atlanta, and there's the, um, the, the shading indicates whether, you know, the number of investor apartment sales uh, over a 16 year period, 17 year period. Um, and on the left, you see just the map of eviction judgments. There's not a whole lot of overlap, but these are the two, two of the variables that we're interested in understanding. Uh, we define investors a little bit differently in this study. In the past study, we kind of did firm by firm research. Um, we were looking at the number of properties owned. Um, in this study, we just used a proprietary indicator from CourtLogic that indicated that the property was purchased for investment purchase, purchase, purchases. Pardon me. And uh, just to give you an example, there's um, a variety of different large firms on the left here, and then some smaller investment funds that we thought um, represented kind of larger number of these investment purchases. Um, and you know the. The buyer names tended to be a variety of financial instruments that were originated by these institutions. So the, the reason that we thought that these investment purchases might be related to um, eviction-led displacement and you know, gentrification that's really characterized by displacement is that we're looking at reports around the city that um, some investors' strategies for realizing profit were really predicated on um, buying uh, apartment complexes and by replacing tenants with you know, higher income tenants or even by um, trying to you know, pursue strategies that involved you know, gentrifying neighborhoods, um, the profit strategy was, was really based around replacing the current renters in, who lived in that building um, with people who could pay higher rents. And this is you know, some of the anecdotal um, conversations that we're having hearing around Atlanta and also we're seeing research uh, along these lines around the country. So we were wanting to understand whether there was a difference in these types of investments and the, the strategies that they pursued um, to realize profit through you know, residential rent, investments in residential rental housing. Um, and we're trying to see whether there's anything systematic related relating these investments and uh, displacement in the city. So the first thing we wanted to, to confirm was just um, you know, some of the, some of the reports we're looking at were had to, had to do with declining cap rates across the country, and you know that relationship between the sales price and you know net operating income kind of coming becoming farther and farther apart. We want to see whether you know the the prices for the same apartment building were really changing over time. So we did a repeat sales analysis looking at the average price of apartment buildings um, relative to the price it would have sold at in uh, 2005, and I'm showing here is just a chart showing, you know, how much more on average um, a given uh, apartment complex would sell for relative to its price in 2005. And what we saw was that overall, for most apartment buildings, um, they on average were selling for 5.5 million more than they would have in 2005. And um, when we just looked at garden style apartments, which are particularly interesting because they tend to be, um, you know, unsubsidized but affordable housing within the Atlanta metro and many other metros around the country, we're seeing that these garden style apartments were selling for 3.5, 3.6 million dollars more than they would have in 2005. Um, and a lot of these, you know, apartments, a lot of the sales occurred again during this price dip. So you can see prices actually went below their 2005 level for several years here, and then they, um, they increased by quite a lot. So the first analysis that we did, and again, I'm not going to show you the full models, but um, I'm happy to share those if you guys do have questions. Um, we wanted to see whether investor purchases were associated with eviction judgments and forced moves. And we also wanted to see whether these investor purchases, um, whether non-investors had the same pattern or whether these types of investors um, were in particularly associated with um, rising eviction judgments. And we, we looked at whether or not they predicted a spike in eviction judgments. So looking at the neighborhood average in evictions, when an investor purchased an apartment complex in a given neighborhood or block group, um, was it more likely for there to be um, a 25% spike in that given neighborhood above its historic average? And what we found was that an investor purchase of multifamily residential, um, there was a 32.6% rise in the odds of an eviction spike in that year. Um, and this wasn't, there was no association with other types of eviction activity like rising eviction filings, which aren't as closely linked with forced moves. Um, so we really 
from this kind of concluded like these investor purchases are associated with um, a rise in forced moves through an evictions process. And we did not find any relationship between non-investor purchases of apartment complexes uh, during this time period. So there's no significance um, when we threw this into the same uh, model and also no significance when we tried to see whether um, these investor purchases, non-investor purchases, you know, had no association with either the kind of forced move related eviction activity or, you know, eviction activity overall. The other analysis that we did was we tried to look at not just forced moves within a given year by looking at evictions, we also tried to look at long-term demographic change. So in this analysis, we wanted to understand whether there was a change in demographics between neighborhoods with and without investor apartment purchases. Um, and, you know, we didn't want to look at when there's an, when there's an investor purchase, you know, do we see changing demographics rel relative to any other neighborhood in the Atlanta metro area? Um, you know, investors do tend to buy apartments in places where prices are, are rising overall, um, all is held equal. So we thought it would make a lot more sense to compare um, investor purchases in neighborhoods um, and then just compare the demographic changes to the adjacent neighborhoods within the same census tract. So just looking at um, at what happened to the racial composition of block groups where an investor made a purchase relative to the adjacent block groups within the same census tract. What we found is that in the six years after an investor purchase, there was a decline in 166 black residents and an increase in 109 white residents um, relative to the, you know, the very narrowly defined neighboring area. So what do we make of all of this? Um, I you know, the, the overall conclusions that I'm drawing from this are that, you know, inst institutional investors and, you know, the, um, the further certain types of integration of capital markets with residential rental housing haven't been great for housing security um, in the Atlanta area and research has shown in, in places around the country. Um, institutional investor purchases of single family rentals are associated with high rates of housing insecurity, very high in the year when we looked and, you know, high eviction filing rates, even after we um, control for lots of different things about the properties and the neighborhoods um, that these places are in. And then in this second study, when we look at investor purchases of multifamily, they're associated with displacement, including forced moves through evictions and, you know, displacement driven neighborhood change. So not the kind of neighborhood change that happens when lots of new people move in and everybody who originally lived there stays, um, but the kind of neighborhood change that happens when the original inhabitants are, you know, forced to leave. Um, so we're finding investor purchases of multifamily are associated with that displacement driven neighborhood change. So what is this, what can we learn, um, what to do or what not to do when we think about the current crisis that we're in? Uh, what are the implications for the COVID-19 housing crisis? Um, and I, you know, I haven't done a research study on this and uh, the jury's still on a lot of different things, but you know, in Atlanta, we've been very engaged with trying to prevent um, measure evictions locally and prevent evictions. Um, and some of the things that we've seen is um, and this actually comes from a study um, from a group in Chicago um, that, you know, many institutional investors continue to evict tenants during the pandemic. They've taken a very, um, you know, confrontational stance to the CDC um, moratorium and, you know, really tried to fight in court. And so, you know, this group documents um, eviction filings uh, across the country by um, different, different real estate investment firms. Uh, in the Atlanta region, we've set up an evictions tracker to try and um, follow how many evictions have been happening. And in the five county area where we're able to um, scrape, uh, we've measured you know, 62,000 eviction filings since the beginning of the pandemic. Not able to collect rent data information in all of these areas, but you know, in one county we are able to collect rent data um, or rent debt data. And we've, we've seen that average rent debts went from you know, $2,000 um, to over $10,000 from January to April of 2020. Um, so we're, we're seeing, just like we're seeing all around the country, um, rising um, distress among rental, uh, among tenants, and, and also from rental property um, operators whose tenants are, are not paying rent. Um, the other thing that, you know, I've, I've sort of seen is that eviction filings are concentrated in particular buildings. Um, and th this may be a little bit because of my research, but I'm seeing eviction as a property driven process, not a neighborhood demographics driven process in some in some sense. Um, I mean, if you looked at a census tract map of evictions, um, 
you might not see these large circles because these are really showing that there are particular buildings in different neighborhoods um, that have very high eviction rates, even though the overall average for the neighborhood is pretty low. Um, so looking at evictions as being driven by particular types of landlords or particular landlords, um, finding those addresses, that has been really key to eviction prevention and some of the strategies that we've used in Atlanta. Um, so, you know, that's another um, kind of outcome of this research, I think, that's relevant for policy. Um, the main takeaways that I, that I think of are that, you know, institutional investors are distressed property investors. Um, the COVID-19 housing crisis may result in distressed property sales, particularly in C-class apartment complexes. Um, you know, so it's different than the foreclosure crisis in that way. Um, but it's similar in that this prevent, presents a similar opportunity to institutional investors. Um, my hope going forward is that, you know, policymakers take advantage of um, the same opportunities that institutional investors want to take advantage of, um, but take advantage of opportunities for preservation of the affordable housing stock. Um, so things like first look programs for affordable multifamily apartments are really important. Um, funding CDFIs who might enable that kind of work, um, that's really important. And, you know, I one of the things that we've kind of been saying around Atlanta is that uh, we're raising an awful lot of money to, um, to help tenants with their rent debt. But wouldn't it be a shame if after raising historic, historic amounts of um, tenant rental assistance, you know, we, we kind of keep a lot of people in place, um, we pay down a lot of uh, tenants debt, and then the pandemic ends, and then we've got nothing to show for it. And we're right back into the affordability crisis that we were in five years ago, um, or three years ago. So, you know, thinking about ways that we can not just get ourselves out of this current crisis, but think long-term about the affordability challenges um, during this moment would be really ideal. Um, some other outcomes of this work um, suggest that we should proactively provide legal assistance to tenants of newly sold apartments um, and either you know, doing this through the courts or doing this at the, at the level of the building um, is maybe ideal. And then just this very broad thing, if displacement is driven by real estate processes, you know, let's see how we can use real estate data sets and properly level models for analysis. You know, you see a lot of displacement um, driven analysis is done kind of at the neighborhood level using demographic data, um, but using data sets on evictions and on property transactions um, might also be really useful for uh, policymakers and, um, you know, interested parties. So thank you very much um, for listening to this talk. Uh, these are the two papers that um, I refer to, and I'm happy to send copies to anybody who's interested. And I really look forward to uh, hearing your questions um, and, and talking more about these housing issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Raymond. Really appreciate those, uh, those remarks and the talk. Um, I do encourage people to, uh, to use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of their screen. We have a couple of questions in already, and so I'll start with those. Um, the first one is a very uh, sort of brief clarifying question. When you mentioned uh, eviction rates of say 20, 22%, what was the time frame for that? Is that over a given year or, or what? You're muted, sorry. Sorry about that. That particular number came from our 2015 data. If you look at eviction lab, you know, they have rates um, over a longer time frame, and they're roughly in line. Um, I have to say that neither of those data sets necessarily control for serial filing, so it, it might be a little bit inflated in terms of that might have been, there might have been some repeated eviction filings between the same landlord and tenant uh, included in that rate, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, one of the attendees asks, how would you respond to the institutional single family renter company perspective? Institutional single family renters would say they have bought distressed homes that few people were buying and that institutional players were in a position to renovate and rent out, which they did. So the counterfactual from their point of view is not that these are single family homes that working class or middle class homeowners would be living in and benefiting from, but rather that these would be single family homes that either would still be empty or owned by perhaps small time uh, slumlords and negatively impacting their neighborhood. I would say that these institutional firms are entirely rational. They are maximizing their profits and they're behaving in ways to maximize their profits. But as an urban planner, um, 
my eye is towards affordable housing and you know neighborhood quality and those are my goals uh, my goals are not to maximize uh, investor profits and so to the extent that we have policymakers making decisions about what to do with say Fannie Mae's bank owned homes or um, if we have um, you know uh, local um, institutions that have some kind of decisions to make um, I think that um, it's, in, it's entirely reasonable to say that local cities or policymakers or CDFIs um, or government agencies should be maximizing uh, long-term affordability and uh, neighborhood quality. And I, and I would also just say that housing is shelter. It's like food and water. Um, it's a basic need. It's not a luxury. So, you know, making sure that we as a society, um, you know, take care of those basic needs and make sure that our community's basic, basic fundamental needs are met um, makes a lot of sense to me. So, I mean, I, I would agree with you that these institutional firms are being entirely rational. They are pursuing profit and that is what they promise to do and that's what they're doing very faithfully. But um, to the question of, you know, should public policymakers support that? I don't, I'm not seeing the case for that. I, I'm having regrets <laughs> over um, the degree to which we do that in the foreclosure crisis and I'm hoping in this crisis that we think about what did and didn't work um, after the last crisis and, and try and maximize what works. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, another question, what do you think about rental subsidies as a long-term solution to these housing insecurities? Do you think that institutional investors would end up making out like bandits? Um, that depends on a lot of other things, you know, they, they might, um, and I, I want to say that there are some urban contexts where, you know, housing choice vouchers, um, are probably the best solution and there are other housing contexts where, um, you know, market rates might, might make that really challenging. Um, so I don't want to say that one size fits all, um, in terms of what I, what I think you're talking about in terms of the housing policy. Uh, what, um, what impact do you think 1031 exchanges and or historically low interest rates have been in accelerating these processes? And maybe there needs to be an explanation of 1031 exchanges. Well, your, first your, your, uh, your reaction to uh, historically low interest rates. Um. I think in general, you know, for, for, you know, there's been a kind of an overall appetite for yield. Um, so for investors who, who want higher interest rates, you know, that's, that's made, I think, rental housing an attractive option um, relative to other kind of really safe investments. Um, so it's probably in increased the general uh, pool of investors who are interested in this type of product. Um, In, in what ways can in what ways can smaller landlords be part of a solution to this uh, housing crisis considering that smaller landlords are often operating on much thinner margins financially I mean the research that we've done has shown that smaller landlords um, have lower eviction rates at least through the kind of formal legal process and we're not studying informal evictions or illegal evictions um, or, you know, displacement that happens outside of the, the court's process. Um, but I, I think that um, CDFIs, ways that they can support smaller um, rental property owners. I think that oftentimes some of these local owners have been providing affordable housing without subsidy um, for a long time in our cities. And that, you know, this isn't a, a landlords are bad kind of talk. This is, um, let's understand how the changing composition of, uh, of landlords is affecting uh, outcomes that we care about. Um, so to the extent that we, we've shown that smaller landlords um, or locally owned regional landlords um, have better outcomes when it comes to evictions, you know, then I think it does make sense that we should um, support them and incorporate them into policies that uh, provide um, affordable housing. 
Um, this question references one of your slides where there was a distinction uh, in the outcomes or the relationships between eviction judgments and eviction filings. Can you say more about those? Uh, do these represent sort of different strategies on the parts of landlords? So the research into, um, and particularly into serial filings has shown that there is just this huge volume. And when I talked about Atlanta, we have like a 22% eviction filing rate and 6% of these, um, a 6% eviction judgment rate. So there's a, a lot of room between those two metrics. Um, and, and that pattern is, you know, you see that across the country. Um, there's a lot of activity in eviction courts that doesn't necessarily end up in a displacement. And I have to say, it's not always clear. And sometimes tenants leave the second they get an eviction notice and they don't wait for the process to, to follow through. So you can have a displacement after an eviction filing. Um, I don't mean to imply that you can't, but the research that has tried to uncover what's going on has shown that um, often eviction courts are used as tools for rent collection. Um, and other research has suggested that uh, evictions are used to kind of convert the, the the landlord tenant relationship into kind of a creditor debtor relationship, which can increase the landlord's leverage around a variety of issues, you know, not just rent payment, but maintenance, stuff like that. Um, so that I think research has shown that um, that's what's going on with a lot of that eviction activity that isn't necessarily about obtaining the legal right to eject somebody from the, from the property. When you think from a landlord's perspective, they don't, vacancies aren't usually aren't a good thing. So you, um, you don't necessarily want to evict a tenant if you're able to, um, if they're able to kind of provide the rent one way or another. Um, so it, those are kind of some of the thoughts that I have about that. Well, another question, what do you think about the role of local initiatives like eviction diversion programs in reducing uh, institutional investor owned evictions and evictions overall? Are there limitations to these approaches? I think, you know, we're currently doing a study on court level um, initiatives in Georgia and Florida um, around eviction prevention. And we're just seeing a lot of variety in the effectiveness of different um, local courts in preventing evictions. So I, um, I think it makes sense that the courts are a point of contact where you can deliver tenant rental assistance or mandate mediation. Um, Kind of working against that, I will say that the qualitative research into eviction courts has shown that um, often these courts are run without a real commitment to due process and they, they also function um, to kind of collect rent. So there's not really an attention, an attention to kind of making sure that tenants' rights and landlords' rights that exist in the statute are, are enforced or, or represented. Um, but there's more of a focus on, you know, doing uh, rent collection. And so when you try and deliver tenant rental assistance um, through an institution that may be more oriented around collecting uh, rent, I'm, I'm not sure how well it works. And I, I think there's a lot of research right now because there's been so much activity around eviction prevention over the last year that's going to give us many more guidelines for how to effectively prevent evictions. Um, so I, I guess I would say I'm pretty optimistic. Um, I'm certainly happy that some of our local courts have started to do the eviction diversion pro programs over the last year, and I prefer it to not doing anything, absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, some uh, successful sort of uh, policy interventions. Um, we have one question about uh, ways in which uh, investors uh, and their activities have been uh, limited. Uh, or they've been, have they ever been kept out of cities or regulated in, in ways? And has that been effective? Um, I think, I mean, what stands out for me is that during the foreclosure crisis, there was a moment when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac actually owned a lot of properties. And certainly you find cities in that situation um, where they, they, you know, have have leverage over um, different different processes, either because you know something's gone through um, a tax foreclosure, or you know because somehow a property um, is under the control of the local jurisdiction. And so I I think that is absolutely a moment when you might um, think about preserving 
um, those properties, you know, for public policy goals. Um, there's a variety of policies around the country, and I, I feel like there might be people in the audience who, who, who they might come more easily to mind, um, where I think that we can kind of divert prop properties, um, you know, to private sector nonprofits who have that, that goal of affordable housing or housing stability, um, you know, or, you know, to housing authorities and, and governmental agencies. Um, uh, a question, uh, do institutional investors in the multifamily study include um, REITs, publicly listed real estate firms, asset managers, and, et cetera? In your multifamily study, you focused on gentrification as the main business strategy of firms. Did you see any of the other strategies from the topology, rehab, flip, milk, et cetera? Right. Yeah, I know they exist. Um, and you you see like some firms have the kind of the flip strategy where they accumulate a lot of properties and they just very quickly sell them to a larger player. Um, we saw a lot of consolidation um, in the single family rental space over the last six, seven years. And so that part of that, part of what was happening, I think is that some of these players had more short-term strategies, um, even though the sector itself seems to be around to stay. I, you know, I haven't, looked for those patterns or tried to describe them in the data. But certainly anecdotally, I know that all of these strategies are being um, worked out. Mm -hmm. um, let me um, follow up on, a, uh, on another point you made in the, uh, in the presentation uh, about uh, investors of multifamily buildings essentially replacing the tenants with those who can, who can um, uh, pay higher rents. Uh, in most cases, this is, is, is this, what role or what culpability do uh, uh, financers play in this when they are um, underwriting a project that, um, uh, uh, that associates debt with the building in such a way that displacement is essentially guaranteed? I mean, I think it depends on the on the financer. I, you know, I wonder if CRA might. I'd, I'm trying to think of what leverage you might have over certain types of lenders and which tools. Um, certainly, if you're talking about a CDFI, I think you can apply some kind of pressure. You you can always apply public pressure. Um, but which regulatory tools might um, restrict a financer from pursuing a strategy that's based on displacement? Um, you know, an entirely private sector um, lender, I'm not sure what those tools would be. I, my sense has been more that the traditional, um, you know, tactics of preservation, of identifying properties that you want to preserve, of proactively reaching out to those owners who you think might be exiting, you know, um, some sort of subsidy or who might, you know, be selling the property um, and, and, you know, sort of using those softer tactics, those are more what have come to mind. I haven't really thought about a lot of regulatory tactics um, that might be used. The, the CFPB has been creative lately, and so I actually wonder if we might hear from David a little bit about, um, you know, I hadn't really thought about, um, about landlords as debt collectors and as falling, un falling under debt regulation um, federal policies, and so I'm really excited about this recent um, ruling that, that kind of mandates that, um, because one of the challenges that we've had in Atlanta is um, a lot of tenants don't know about the CDC moratorium. And we've literally been collecting addresses and then mailing people postcards, which is not efficient. Um, and so it's exciting to hear that there's um, tools at the federal level that can be used to really notify tenants of their rights more proactively um, than is currently happening. Um, um, we have a question uh, related to your uh, your comment about um, not wanting the subsidy money we have used in COVID-19 to go to waste. Can you talk more about what that would look like to you? How can we help to make sure uh, those funds uh, avoid going back, uh, after expending those funds, uh, avoid going back into an affordability crisis? 
Yeah, one of the questions that I've had is that I think a lot of our, you know, um, unsubsidized affordable housing rental stock is really challenged right now in terms of, um, you know, tenants have not been able to pay rent. Um, they haven't, not, not all of them have gotten the kind of mortgage forbearance that's been extended, um, you know, to some rental property operators. And so there might be a, a lot of properties changing hands. And to the extent that we see um, local CDFIs, philanthropic groups, you know, local jurisdictions raising money to pay rent, um, I just wonder if that could just be a down payment instead. And you might combine that with some kind of subsidized finance. Um, you know, the Fed has been really ambitious and creative lately about um, using subsidized finance to, you know, help small businesses, help um, municipalities. Um, so, you know, combining the, the, the capitalism raised for tenant rental assistance and the, with, you know, subsidized finance to make sure that these properties um, don't become unaffordable in the next decade, you know, particularly after we're raising historic levels of money, we've never seen these kinds of figures um, for, you know, for very low income tenants. So um, I, I think the question is kind of, we'd have to make a kind of pro forma and really look at the numbers. Do they all work out? So that's the question that's in my mind, but that, that would be my hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether this question is coming from a researcher or uh, an activist. Um, the, um, the question is, how do you identify large institutional investors operating in a local area? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, it's really hard because of the, um, it's hard to know the beneficial owners of an LLC a lot of the time. A lot of times there's um, a nested structure where there's, you know, an LLC owning, another LLC owning a trust, et cetera, and so on. So it can be impossible to identify who actually owns a property. Um, usually the, the data sets that I use are tax assessors data or deeds data, and those identify who the literal owner is, but it doesn't really tell you who the top level owner is. Um, there are some states like in Georgia, we have a, you know, regi um, a registry that's occupied, uh, operated by the state in which, you know, corporations have to identify themselves and that can provide some information. Um, sometimes you can, um, just looking at the name and doing a little bit of research around the name, you can figure out who, um, which institutional investor you think that firm is associated with. And I've seen really interesting research like, um, I guess Luxembourg has some reporting requirements that allow you to identify, you know, the owners of LLCs that own single family rentals in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and so people have made use of those data sets. I think the I think Treasury actually collects all of this information, but it has not been made available to the public. And there's currently, um, you know, there's some lawsuits and FOIA requests, you know, trying to make information about residential housing available. And I believe New York City has a, a reporting law at this point, um, you know, identifying who the beneficial owner is of residential real estate. So I think local jurisdictions can help. Um, obviously, the federal government has this information already and, and could, you know, um, shed more light on who the owners are. But typically, what I and other researchers have done is just taken tax assessors data and deeds data, um, and then just done a lot of research around different corporate um, names. Yeah, that's enormously labor intensive. Um, yeah, I've seen some people try to kind of use machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I just think at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, sitting there um, and, and trying to assemble the information. Right. What you're, but what you're talking about is greater transparency in ownership structure. And mm -hmm. that ought to be possible either by reforming uh, reporting requirements or, uh, or making that data more available from the federal government. I think so, yeah. Um, other questions um, that are out there, I think um, I, I invite them. Um, I will ask uh, one that uh, I'm wondering about, your, your in-depth analysis was done uh, in the Atlanta metro area. Um, so say something about the generalizability of that. Is there anything uh, about the Atlanta market or uh, that would 
um, that that may not hold elsewhere? Is there is there any concern on your part? Yeah, I mean, I think when there's some rental markets that are there's some cities that are undergoing decline, you know, flat or declining prices, um, not a lot of in migration, not a lot of population growth, not a lot of income growth. Atlanta's not in that situation, and so there's the broader um, conditions there for um, rents to rise and for land prices to rise. And so cities that aren't in that situation, I think you probably wouldn't see the same pattern or you would see much longer term strategies being taken by investors. Um, and when you know we talked about the maps of where investors were investing, the Sunbelt, I think, generally provided those conditions where prices were relatively low um, you know, cities like Boston, prices rebounded almost before they fell um, because there's just so much demand there, um, and there wasn't a lot of additional housing stock built during during the early 2000s. Um, so the Sun Belt conditions, I think, and it's not just the Sun Belt, but that's a good enough rubric um, provided the environment where this strategy would work. And some of the research I referenced kind of showed that you know, high price tier cities and low price tier cities, the, the profit strategy is a little bit different. And I think you'll see that trickle down to, um, you know, what the outcomes are for tenants and neighborhoods as well. What would you counsel um, uh, to advocacy groups or even to individuals about uh, what they can do um, to change this situation? What, what, what are the uh, most important sort of pressure points? I think that what seems to have been effective in our region is, is just, you know, you were talking earlier about transparency and kind of identifying um, who these owners are and identifying some of the patterns that are problematic for tenants and for neighborhoods. Um, it, it seems like identifying these firms and starting those conversations between community groups and the firms or journalists in these firms or you know your mayor in these firms has been pretty helpful. Um, so one, one of the problems we face here in Atlanta is that we don't easily have evictions data available. And we weren't really um, aware of the extent of the problem until people started scraping evictions data. Um, and matching it up with property owners. And that just that the basic facts have, have moved things a lot. Um, and some of the, you know, worst offenders are unfortunately, you know, light tech property owners and people you definitely have a lot of leverage with. Um, so working more closely with, you know, um, with affordable housing developers who are subsidized around housing instability after you've identified a problem. I think can be very powerful. I mean, some of the a lot of the work that we've done has been with you know a project-based Section Eight property in Atlanta, um, where we just identified they have an extremely high eviction rate, very affordable rents, but you know not where we wanted them to be in terms of housing and stability or maintenance and stuff like that. Thank you very much, Professor Raymond. Um, if there aren't any other questions, and I don't see any, uh, I do want to. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, for sharing your work in this area. It's very important uh, research that you're doing. It's a very important policy issue that a lot of cities uh, are are facing. We are facing here in the in the Twin Cities as well. Um, so we're very grateful for you to have uh, shared your information and your time with us today. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I appreciated hearing all of your questions and. Um, uh, thanks very much. All right. Under normal circumstances, we take you out to dinner now, but uh, <laughs> uh, I will uh, uh, consider that uh, uh, something that we owe you at this point. So that sounds we'll we'll take a rain check. That sounds good. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye.